So our next speaker, uh, again, she doesn't need much introduction, Swati Tyagarajan. You might have seen her on NDTV, um, screaming at most of, most of us because we're not doing enough for conservation. But sorry. Um, but on serious note, uh, Swati's been reporting uh, on environment issues with NDTV for uh, almost a decade and a half. Uh, various across the board from uh, people's rights to conflict to uh, various other uh, environmental issues. And, and I think this discussion came up today through various talks as well, is that the, 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 the role that media plays in actually uh, sensitizing people about conservation. And so without giving, so Swati, uh, and, and she came all the way from South, she lives in South Africa now, so she's come, I really appreciate the fact that she's come all the way for this niche and focus to talk about her work. Thank you, Swati. Thanks. Okay, I've been uh, with NDTV as a conservation journalist for 21 years now, and for uh, 15 of those years, I was lucky enough to have my own show, uh, Born Wild. Um, I did uh, reports from across India on conservation issues, and then I did report uh, quite a bit from Southern Africa as well. Hello, Born Wild, a show that takes you to the heart of wild India. It takes you up close and personal to some of India's most endangered animals and the people who help them fight for their survival. It's angry, desperate villagers trying to save their crops and homes. And it's angry, hungry elephants desperate for food. The sloth bear is a scheduled one animal. Basically, it enjoys the same status of protection as the tiger. But for years in India's tradition, for 300 years, they've been used in captivity as dancing bears. Yeah, so um, what I'm going to talk about today is something that I've learned in my time, something very extraordinary and special, um, and that's what I want to talk about. Uh, for a lot of people, what I might say uh, might be impossible, even improbable, but I think uh, you guys in the audience, and especially from the talks that I've heard, I think many of you might recognize what I'm saying since you would have had these experiences in wilderness yourself. Um, unbeknownst to me, it started for me when I was about five years old. I was very, very lucky to have an excellent mentor who took me into wilderness and introduced me to nature in a very big way. Uh, uh, Siddharth Butch, Uncle Siddharth as I knew him, he was a naturalist and an ornithologist and he would take me walking um, into the forest near where I grew up which was in Chennai and uh, it was a theosophical society and often when we'd walk in the forest together he'd make me go up to a tree and hug it and then he'd make me press my ear up against the trunk and I was about as I said five or six years old and uh, he'd tell me if I pressed my ear hard enough against the tree trunk, then the tree would tell me secrets and stories of the forest. Um, he told me how it would tell me about from the little mushroom that grew on its roots to its own bark, to the branch, to the twig, to the leaf, to the flowers and fruit uh, on that tree, how they were not just related to the tree that they were found on, but related to every other tree in that forest and to every plant and animal that was found in that landscape. Um, and sometimes when we, um, as you can see here, I, you know, as an adult, I still end up hugging, and that's a baobab in Africa, I still hug trees a lot, so I'm a tree hugger and proud of it. Uh, but uh, other times when we'd walk in the forest, um, you know, he'd make me stop and really observe and look around me. And then um, he'd say about, he'd talk to me about how there'd be like this little bird somewhere and he'd talk about how that little bird could tell me incredible stories, you know, because he would stop me and he'd be like, young lady, do you think you're the only thing with a brain here that's observing the things around you? He's like, look at that little bird. That little bird could tell you about how it was a chick, how it survived, how she survived when her brothers and sisters didn't, um, how she dodges predators, how she survives storms, how she lives through changing seasons, how she found a mate and had little chicks of her own. She knew when you came into the forest even when she didn't see you and she'll be able to tell exactly where you're going. She will inform everybody else in this forest about what you're doing and they will then decide if they want to hide or stay when you're coming. So do you think, young lady, that you're the only brain here observing this forest? So when I was a child, of course, I had the open instincts that children have, and I didn't question what he said, and I took everything that he said for what it was. And then, of course, I grew up, I got tamed down, as I say, you know, children are born wild, and as adults, we get tamed down by the urban chaos around us. And as a domesticated uh, house pet, really, like a human animal, off I went to NDTV, and when I got there, you know, I thought I'd be like this crusading environment Today's uh, show, reporter. Today's all the way across to the west, to Saurashtra in Gujarat, the Gir Sanctuary and National Park, the last home to the wild Asiatic lion. The 
question is we cannot find the motivation to save that so tiger. essentially what i thought i'd be like this big crusader for and wildlife you know i'd be out the there i talk about conservation and i would then creature. save you know or we help save these animals uh, so that's where i was i was a very uh, for conservation anti people journalist i thought conservation meant inviolate spaces for wildlife um, I thought in order to save animals like the tiger, you had to keep you know, forests separate and people separate. That's how I started as a journalist when I went to NDTV. And of course, in a few years into uh, what I was doing and traveling across India and being into those beautiful wilderness spaces and meeting the most amazing local people, it slowly started to change for me. And it was in those travels that I started to learn something extraordinary. And it's what I slowly work on, on what I call the dark zones and the golden zone theory. So it started for me in in 2002, uh, when I went to uh, in uh, Pori in uh, in Garhwal, uh, I I went there because at the time uh, leopards apparently had attacked, injured, and killed uh, several people. Two children had been killed, um, and the forest department had called in a professional hunter to come and shoot the leopards. And the uh, village after village that I went to in Pori, uh, people were enraged. They were angry. Uh, they wanted every single leopard they removed, not just the ones that had uh, allegedly killed the people, but every single leopard and all. All of them told me firmly that the leopards had, they had never come to the village before, they'd never seen there before, and they wanted the leopards out. And old grandfather pulled me aside and he told me about how uh, he used to walk with the leopards that he called the shadow of the forest. He said how their generation used to walk with the shadows. They understood the shadow, they knew when to go, when not to go, how to be, they could talk to the shadows. And he said how that had changed drastically. And right now, when, I mean, when I was in Pori at the time, there was so much anger um, and they did shoot two leopards that they thought were responsible for the killings and then they ended up capturing several uh, but the conflict actually only got worse. Uh, then I went to um, Nagarjuna Sagar, Sri Salem Tiger Reserve, uh, where I spent some time with the Chenchu tribals. They're some of the most marginalized uh, tribes that we have in this country. And I asked the Chenchus, you know, about their life in the forest. And they told me about how uh, when they walk into the forest, their god of the sky and the goddess of the forest would protect them. You know, they would pray to the spirits and then they would walk into the forest and they'd be protected. And they said they were actually more nervous of the forest department, the police and the Naxals than they were of the tigers whom they called a brother who walked with them. And uh, in living memory, uh, none of the Chenchus could remember a single attack of a tiger on a Chenchu, and none of, there was not a single tiger death uh, that had been attributed to the Chenchu. So a story like Pordy to me was what I started slowly seeing as the dark zones, and a story like what I experienced in, in, in uh, Nagarjuna Sagar, Sri Salem Tiger Reserve, I started seeing as the golden zone. Um, and then I spent time in Southern Africa, and I was very, very fortunate to spend time with the San or the Bushmen um, in Southern Africa. Uh, the three women you see here are called the hearts of the spears. Uh, they're shamans. And I had this extraordinary uh, uh, days that I spent with them. And then they spoke to me about their philosophy of how they see the natural world around them. And it's what we call the living matrix. And what they said was amazing. They said, if you walk into your own garden, even if it's in your house and it's not in a jungle, and you see a little bird, and you pay attention to that little bird, a small thread is formed between you and that bird. And then you go in, go every day, and you see that same bird every day, that thread gets stronger. Then in your observations, you notice what time you're seeing her. You see which bush or tree that she's sitting on. You see what she's eating. You see what is coming there to maybe predate upon her. You learn her singing. You learn her sounds. You learn how to identify her. And all that time that you spend with her, you start knowing noticing everything else around her and in that space of yours. And in that way, hundreds of thousands of threads form from you uh, to all these beings that are around you. And they said that these threads come together and form the ropes they call the ropes to God. And uh, this is, in science, we explain this as the web of life. And we explain it as if we are separate to that web of life. But the way the San Shaman explained it to me, we were the center of those threads that were going out, forming this incredible rope, which was the ropes to God. And they told me that all that the rope was made of was love. So I then spent a lot of time 
um, in uh, Tamil Nadu as well, tracking with irulas. I love snakes, so I used to go out with them a lot when they used to go on there, uh, you know, because uh, they used to catch the snakes or the venom for snake park, you know, they could extract the venom for uh, making anti-venom. And then I also spent a lot of time tracking with, of course, since I live in Southern Africa, with the Bushmen. Um, and this is Nate, one of the most extraordinary people I've met. <laughs> So with these kind of extraordinary experiences that I had seen, um, it was, you know, it changed me from looking at conservation as something that is separate to us. So I really have to say that for me, it was like this eye-opening thing where with all these years of experiences, I felt so entwined with everything that was happening with the natural world around me. So now here we're talking about indigenous people. So could it be that maybe indigenous peoples know something that we don't, that we lose in, you know, in our urban lifestyles? Uh, but then we know certain things for sure about intelligence and sentience. Take southern right whales. You know, southern right whales, um, yeah, so southern right whales, you know, we, I have them coming past my house where I live in Cape Town every year. Um, and when they, they were called the right whales because they were seen as the right whales to kill. So in, when whaling was allowed in South African waters, a lot of these whales were killed and um, they stopped actually coming on their annual migration through those waters. When whaling was banned, within two years of the whaling being banned, the whales were back. How did they know? Now there are humpback whales that also come through and pass again by my house when on their way into Antarctica to feed. Now humpbacks, uh, science has proven that we all know that whales communicate by clicking, making clicking sounds. Humpback whales, for example, one pod makes clicking sounds and they have different clicking sounds to the clicking sounds that another pod might make. And that means that's language differences. Um, science has proven that humpback whales in Australia have a different accent uh, to their clicks than humpback whales found in South America. I mean, think about that, like an accent. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing. Take monarch butterflies, you know, migrate from um, Canada and all the way down to winter in the southern parts of the United States. By the time they do their second over winter, we're into the fourth or fifth generation of butterflies, which means they've bred and they've mated and died, and the fifth generation is making that journey. How do those butterflies know what the route is? How do they know where to go? How do they know? They go back to the exact same trees. Where is that intelligence coming? coming from, what is that intelligence? So you take now, you come to the octopus. I mean, the only invertebrate seen as sentient as any of your mammals, as whales or elephants or dolphins, they're considered as sentient. Um, um, octopus are so adaptable and so intelligent and curious that if you put them in a new uh, surrounding and you move them, they interact with that surrounding in an extremely curious way, almost like they're playing. Uh, that's why they're such escape masters in most aquariums that try to keep them. And, uh, you know, and they have such an extraordinary way of interacting. I I'd snorkel with them a lot as they're one of my favorite animals and they some of them are really inquisitive some of them are really shy so many different personalities not one is like the other so there's one thing that we think is separate to us and we call that consciousness um, can we really say that these sentient beings don't have a consciousness and that's something only humans do? I mean, many of you are in the field, you've studied individual animals, you've studied species, you've spent time. Are you not blown away from time to time that when you see an animal that you think you know so well, just react completely differently to anything that you have imagined in that moment because in that moment it's showing extreme adaptability and intelligence to stimuli it's facing at that point. If that kind of intelligence isn't the precursor to consciousness than what is. So when it comes down to how we define ourselves as human, everything from tool use to language to social bonds to um, uh, now consciousness, everything is proven and provable in the, in, the, in the natural world. So what makes us so different? And having studied animals since I was a very little kid, um, I see that the animals have these skills, and it's obvious that they do, and a lot of researchers will tell you that they do. You know, the phenomenon of directional bonding, homing pigeons, for instance, you know, how strange is it that a bird can fly directly to a point on a landscape having never been there, you know, being put in a basket and taken on a crazy route to get there, and they fly exactly back to where they came from, or when I've been, been involved with radio telemetry studies, and the mountain lion that's got the collar on it's flown 100 miles directly to the east into the mountains, again, into a place it's never been. 
uh, the cat beelines straight back to the suburban neighborhood where it's been caught. Yeah, so directional bonding. I mean, as Vidya and everyone was talking about, um, you know, when you capture an animal, you can trank it, you know, uh, put it in a cage, put it on a plane, train, automobile, whatever, move it kilometers from where it's been found, and that animal will make a beeline back to where it was caught. Now, what is that intelligence? And okay, maybe these are just animals, so therefore we're thinking of only animals as conscious and sentient beings. But we know today, look at forests, the amount of research that's been done. Trees are social beings. They have complicated social structures. They support each other. A mother tree will feed another dying tree. The fungus that grows in their roots through the forest actually act as a neural network. I mean, there's extraordinary research coming out about the intelligence. And some of you may have read about the hidden life of trees or the secret life of plants. Uh, so there's so much that is so extraordinary and sentient in the natural world. But then I met a woman who took my understanding of this to a completely different realm. And that just was extraordinary and blew me out of the water. And her name, um, oh, sorry, this is just the slide for the forest. Her name was uh, um, Anna uh, Breitenbach. Now, Anna is a woman of European descent, descent but South African. Um, she calls herself an animal communicator. As an animal communicator, she, what, she, what she is is an interspecies specialist. Now we know that in a forest, uh, different organisms and different animals and trees and plants can all, there is some level of communication and conversation that's going on there. So can we, as the human animal, shouldn't we be able to have these conversations? So when I spent two years filming with her, I watched in amazement as she worked with a, a black leopard in a captive situation uh, who had been moved from zoo to zoo and he was incredibly abused and he'd attacked and put three of his caregivers in hospital. And I watched as she worked with that animal and completely transformed his behavior. I made sure that Anna had no information on Diablo or his history before she came to speak to the black leopard. I was nervous to see what would happen as this animal never let anyone near his night shelter without a lot of snarling and growling. But the minute he saw Anna, he calmed down and let her kneel right outside and look at him. So this movie, The Animal Communicator, after we made it, um, it went out to many countries, and then it was a lot of clips and subclips were put out on YouTube, and uh, it had millions and millions of hits. But more important than that was the fact that um, I still get a lot of messages from people around the world telling me about their own personal um, interactions that they've had with either their pets or wild animals, and it's an extraordinary thing. It's two different animals. It's two totally, totally different personalities. We had a snarling cat, angry at everything, um, upset about being here, hating humans, hating us for having him here, um, you know, ready to kill in an instant. To this relaxed black leopard that's lying on top of his log in his shelter is this attitude of, you recognize me for who I am now? So um, that was the leopard, you know, going from being a really, really quite a dangerous animal to someone, uh, to an animal that had calmed down a lot. Uh, but in the time that I was making the film with Anna, I also got to know about, um, or, uh, got to know uh, this other extraordinary person called Cheeto, uh, this gentleman who lived in Costa Rica and South America through my husband who was making a film on his life and it was called Touching the Dragon. Um, Cheeto saved a South American crocodile. Uh, he found the crocodile as a juvenile with a bullet hole in his head, um, and the crocodile was nearly dead. Cheeto, against all odds, um, helped this crocodile come back to life. After he had nursed it back to health, he released the crocodile in the water systems, and the crocodile came back. He did this several times, released this animal several times, and each and every time the animal came back to him. And Cheeto named this crocodile Pocho, and they had a 23-year extraordinary relationship. In 23 years of Cheeto working with Pocho, he didn't even have a scratch on his body. And these are reptiles that are considered some of the most dangerous animals in the world. Very gently when he's happy, and with strength when he's agitated.
We have this routine of movements we have created over the years, like two dancers. We are in a dance. If I forget one of the moves, he doesn't like it. He won't cooperate. That's when I have to go back and do the movement again. Then he does it much better and he's happy again. And um, were these just two extraordinary people? Could this just was it them? But then I did a lot of research and reading, and I came across uh, Paha in Ghana. Uh, in Paha in Ghana, in a small village, there are two ponds. Both these ponds are filled with the Nile crocodiles. Um, the villagers here in Paha worship these animals because they revere them for holding the souls of their ancestors. Uh, so in, in again, in the living memory of Paha, in ancestral memory, they've never, ever hurt or hunted a crocodile. And the ex upon the Paha and Ghana. In this tiny, peaceful African town, children romp in the village pond, and so do their good friends, the crocodiles, 110 of them. Young men fish knee-deep next to what may look like logs, but these logs have very sharp teeth. Still, the people and the crocodiles of Pega have developed an unusual mutual respect. We believe that they are the souls of the relatives of this town. So they are sacred animals. We don't hit them. We don't kill them. We don't harm them. And the crocodile. And then you come to, I think, uh, Giri was talking about it, and, um, you know, Bera and Javai here in, in India. Now, you know, you can talk about whether the leopards used to be baited or not for um, hunting purposes, and if that maybe changed their behavior a little bit, and it doesn't matter. The point is, on several visits there, I spoke to uh, the herders, the rabadis, who have the goats and the cattle and all of them, and it was extraordinary. They didn't give me some fuzzy love story about how they love and, you know, check the leopard, but it was a brilliant story of mutual respect between two predators on the same landscape, uh, where they were proud that both predators could live and share that landscape together. And again, in, in Java and Beira, in living memory, there's been no attack on people by a leopard. Um, and you know, and when you think of the human animal, um, the human uh, leopard interface in other parts of the country, which can turn negative, it's quite an extraordinary thing. So this, to me, created more and more ideas on the dark zones and the golden zones, places like Paha in Ghana, uh, Java and Beira, you know, these became like the, um, the golden zones for me. Um, so here, um, uh, after being, I and mean, after witnessing all of this, I realized that the dark zone is a place where, uh, and I spoke to Dr. Vidya, who you've heard, so I'm just going to play what she had to say about what she's seen with her research uh, on, on so leopards. At my experience of translocation of communities, you know, where there has been conflict, where communities live with these animals without conflict, communities which worship the large cat as a god, it is very obvious to me that when you understand these animals and respect them, you definitely have lesser problems with them. I mean, it's evident. Yeah. And then um, I, um, you know, talk about the dark zones. So dark zones are places where there's so much anger and a, a willingness not to understand and a willingness not to see or share the landscape with them. And this is what dark zones lead to. And the golden zones, you know, you have places where people are willing to understand, they're willing to share the spaces, they want uh, these animals to thrive, and wildlife thrives in those places, and there is barely, all the human um, animal interface is usually a very, very positive one. And India, uh, with all our challenges and problems, with all of our um, various issues that we face here, I mean, it's extraordinary that in India that we have what is called, uh, you know, representations of the golden zone. We are one of the 
the 17 mega diverse countries of the world, we have anywhere from 400 people a square kilometer to a lakh or 25,000 sometimes people a square kilometer um, outside protected areas and still we have so much wildlife. And it comes from that respect and the dark zones of the developed worlds where usually like in America, the US, uh, the US, I mean in Europe, if a single big animal like a bear or a wolf or a, a mountain lion is found anywhere near human habitation, it is shot instantly without even a debate. And I, and I had the opportunity to interview Sir David Attenborough and I asked him about this reverence for nature and how important it was and what it meant and this is you're what he said. You're a scientist, you've agreed it's paleontology, you've studied natural history, but when I watch you in your programs, um, while there is, of course, all of that, but just personally, I feel, this is a viewer watching you, that there is an awe and a reverence almost that comes through in the way that you enjoy being in the natural world. How does it make you feel? Well, I'm, I'm pleased that you should say that's the case. Um, I, I do think the natural world is treasure, and I do think that human beings don't have the right to simply dispose of it in any way they wish. Um, I think that the natural world has to be respected. It's one of the greatest treasures that humanity has. And, but the point is we are part of the natural world. Uh, there, is, there is every mouthful of food we eat depends on the natural world. Every breath of air depends on the natural world. Um, and, and we are part, if we damage the natural world, in the end we damage ourselves. And we are putting yeah, so um, to me that this is where the dark zones and the golden zones work and it's, it dawns on me that it's this incredible, um, you know, beautiful landscapes that we have, this wilderness, this natural life that we have around us. Um, I realized that Uncle Siddharth all those years ago had been absolutely right. There's a gigantic brain there, a uh, the gigantic sentience that is watching me the whole time that I think I'm standing there watching it. She's assessing me the whole time, observing me the whole time, and she's doing that because she sees me as a part of her. She doesn't see me as something that is separate. It's me. I hold myself as separate, and when that distance dissolves, uh, then everything changes. And then we can observe things for the way they are. And as a conservation journalist today, um, you know, it's very, very important that we preserve and protect these golden zones. Uh, the dark is spreading. We know that there is, uh, you know, we're losing forests in India. There's a lot of conflict and there are a lot of issues. And as a conservation journalist, I think, and as people like you, photographers, filmmakers, making these stories, I think this sentience and this understanding needs to be brought in and we need to keep our stories sensitive and we need to understand and report report on what is positive about pretty much everything that's happening. Because with everything that is going on, as I said, India still has this extraordinary natural history. And, and we have a decade, really, if that, to protect it all. And so I will end by saying the one thing that's always struck me uh, as the most honest thing and the greatest thing that I have learned, which is that the greatest habitat that we have for any wildlife or wilderness is the human heart. Thank you.